Uh, I'm, I'm Ani, I'm from IHME at University of Washington, and I'll be sharing uh, some results on mapping access to safe water and sanitation, and what are the implications for disease control. So the motivation for this project, um, as this room knows better than most, um, that water and sanitation are strong risk factors for under five mortality, and that we can use water and sanitation interventions to prevent um, disease burden and also reduce outbreak vulnerability. Um, but most importantly, water and sanitation access can give us a, a measure of um, the environmental dynamics for disease transmission of enteric diseases. So when we look at sort of the infectious disease pathway, we have um, this sort of cycle of pathogens where we have start at the host, which uh, defecates in some sanitation facility, which is ideally treated uh, through some waste management system and then released back in the environment. And that's from that same environment, we draw uh, a water supply, which is then treated and then accessed by the host through some drinking water facility. So, in our project, when we're mapping the JMP indicators, what we're really looking at is a map of the point of use sanitation facilities and the drinking water facilities, and not fully capturing the entire pathway of enteric disease transmission. Um, as was indicated in the first working group, um, so these are the JMP indicators of facility types of improved, unimproved, and surface water, um, and then improved, unimproved, and open defecation. So we have received um, healthy criticism that these indicators are quite broad, especially for improved. Uh, for example, comparing um, to flush toilets versus improved latrines or improved wells and a piped water supply. So we have decided to not only model um, access to improved facilities at large, but use that as an envelope and then subset specifically what is the proportion of population that has access to a piped water supply, as well as what is the proportion of the population that is using a sewer sewered or a septic tank system, similar to how the GMP has done in their latest 2017 results. So why use a uh, geospatial approach? I mean, we have the GMP estimates and many other country reports, but the advantage of a geospatial framework is that we can gather data at all spatial scales, so country reports, studies, baseline studies from, uh, uh, you know, scientific literature, um, other surveys at regional and district level, and compile all of those resources and use it in a single modeling framework. Um, additionally, there is inherent spatial and temporal trends that are present in the data that we collect, and using a geospatial approach allows us to exploit those to get the best estimates of population level access. The main two advantage of the geospatial approach is that we can measure uh, geospatial equity, which is particularly important for SDG 6 monitoring, as if you want universal access, it should be geographically universal. But also, we can produce continuous maps that go beyond political boundaries. So as we know, for uh, infectious disease uh, zones of endemicity, they don't always, they're usually a hybrid between administrative areas and environmental features, and having continuous maps allows us to aggregate up measures of access to areas that are of most relevance and interest to policymakers. So let me highlight um, the advantage of a geospatial approach. So this is Ghana in 2015 with access to improved sanitation. In the lower right-hand corner, you have the national level estimate, which is 65%. Um, this is usually the type of estimate that's um, available in a country report. Then you have uh, the region level estimates, which is what the JMP, or sorry, DHS and MIX provide. And so you can see there's significant heterogeneity. The southern regions are, have better access, which is where most of the population is. Then we break that down into um, districts in Ghana, and you can see even within the states, there is a pattern. And then going down even further to the five by five kilometer level, you can make out in particular districts that you can really see the urban rural gradient that's well documented in the WASH literature. 
um, that even within districts, there's spatial heterogeneity in terms of access to water and sanitation services. So how do we actually make those kind of maps? So we, like I alluded to earlier, we gather environmental data, national and subnational survey, census information, program information, and scientific literature. Our philosophy is that if there's data out there, we would like to use it. Uh, so we really don't um, try to be biased in our selection of data sources. We take all of this data and convert it to a geospatial format. So where we have GPS information available, we tag all of the data with GPS information. But we also have the capacity to transform regional uh, data into um, so we can integrate in, into the geospatial model. We leverage this data with covariates. So we have a large library of covariates that include satellite measurement and modeled estimates. And so then in our modeling framework, we take our input data, we fit it with a lot of different types of modeling techniques. So we get different versions of access maps since we know different types of models capture different types of relationships. And then you combine these maps in a single uh, ensemble model to get a final estimate of uh, population level access to water and sanitation. So these, this is our preliminary map. So we're, able, we're right now in the process of estimating uh, both access to water and sanitation at, um, or across 103 countries. So, you know, we see the classic pattern of, for example, in India, the southern, uh, southern India has higher access than northern India, and then, um, but, um, but we're in the process of iterating across this. So this is uh, pipe water, this is improved sanitation, and so we're hoping that by making these maps and releasing them publicly, um, it will be useful for the GTFCC and other decision makers um, to basically use this in sort of identifying hotspots or any other research gaps that are needed. And um, so I'm running out of time, but <laughs> I ideally what I want to highlight is while this only measures point of use access, we can still learn a lot. For example, in the Bangladesh situation, you might have high levels of access to piped water, but if there's still a lot of cholera, what that's indicating is we know that we need to go further upstream. So we, the point of use of drinking water facility is, is doing well, but the water treatment of the, of the distribution is not doing well. So I hope that um, this resource is useful to all of you. And at IHME, we are more than looking forward to any feedback on how we can disseminate this better and any um, feedback you have on particular indicators that you would like to map you would like us to map. So that's this is basically what I just summarized. Right, thank you. <laughs>